Ladies and gentlemen, um, we've a few minutes before we start, so I'll get into some housekeeping so that we get maximise our, our time uh, together. Can I welcome everyone to today's uh, meeting, Famagusta, from tragedy to opportunity. My name is uh, David Burrows. I'm Member of Parliament uh, for Enfield Southgate. I'm also the, the Chairman of the Cyprus All-Party Parliamentary Group. This meeting is uh, um, particularly organised by the Famagusta Association of Great Britain and Lobby for Cyprus, and we're grateful for them for the organisation of today's event. There are a large number of people here. We have uh, a distinguished uh, panel who I'll introduce uh, shortly. We have also some uh, guests, uh, uh, particularly Roko Marina, Yakitakoulis, uh, Member of the European Parliament. Thank you very much uh, for coming. It's excellent to have you with us. We have other parliamentarians. I can see uh, Matthew Offord, the Member of Parliament uh, for Hendon, who's with us, and other parliamentarians will be joining us through uh, today. It's uh, the last day of the Queen's speech, and so there's a number of people who are taking part in that debate in Parliament. But uh, it's excellent to be prepared. It is, there are a large number of people here. It'd be interesting to know how many are Fam Augustans. Hands up, number of... Fantastic. Well, you, you're particularly welcome, and uh, that uh, says a lot in itself um, that uh, a large number of you are here and also representing families uh, and generations, and uh, you're extremely welcome particularly, as well as those who are uh, not from uh, Famagusta as well. Uh, and I think the, the context of this debate is to ensure that we hear a number of voices, and uh, so I, I welcome you all here. If people could uh, turn off their, their mobile phones so that we're not interrupted uh, by the, the phone or any other, any other communication systems. And uh, we also make sure that uh, we hear from our panel and then we'll be opening it. We want to hear from, uh, from those who are uh, gathered here. And we want to, uh, in this parliament, we, we welcome exchange, free exchange of views, um, indeed uh, differing views as well. Uh, but we also want to ensure that everyone treats everyone with respect and uh, listens to each other carefully and, and I'll call you to order if uh, you're not showing those principles of respect, but I'm sure I won't need to do that. Um, but firstly, I'd like to particularly welcome our panel here. Um, I'd like to particularly welcome Alexandros Lianos, uh, Mayor of Famagusta, thank you very much for coming. Uh, welcome Dr. Klikos uh, Kyriakides, Senior Lecturer in Law. Uh, also welcome Andreas Theophanis, uh, Professor of Political Economy. And finally, Mark Stevens, uh, who's a well-known uh, human rights lawyer, also very welcome as well. Um, our speakers um, could speak for a, a long time on these uh, subjects, um, but uh, I've asked them to confine their words to a maximum of uh, 15 minutes, and I'll be holding them to account on that time as we go through, and then we'll be able to have a, long t a good time for discussion. So can I, first of all, invite uh, Dr. Klikos uh, Kirikides, Senior Election Law, to uh, open the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so how on earth is it going to guarantee the Republic of Cyprus? And I've picked up the Guardian, which has a picture of the Acropolis on the front page, and it tells us that governments are preparing for the worst as the massive cost of the likely Greek Euro exit emerges. Further afield, the Arab Spring is still unfolding with uncertain implications for Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria, and their neighbors. It remains to be seen as to whether the Arab Spring descends into an Islamist winter. In the meantime, it may be no coincidence that with each passing day, the remnants of Christianity in the greater Middle East are being depleted. In the words of the Archbishop of Canterbury, at the present moment, the position of Christians in the region is more vulnerable than it has been for centuries. With this background in mind, I will now try to place the fate of Famagusta into some sort of historical and legal context. Did you know that the distance between the frozen war zone of Famagusta and the active war zone of Homs in Syria is less than the distance between London and Amsterdam? This small detail illustrates a, shock, a stark juxta juxtaposition. On the one hand, the Republic of Cyprus is legally subject to the same democratic norms, values, and European Union legal framework as the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and other EU partners. <laughs> Yet on the other hand, the Republic remains geographically, and to some extent psychologically, part of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Greater Middle East. All of which brings me to my central argument. 
Since biblical times, a constant theme of the region has been the wielding of raw, unrestrained power, often by European or local governments and their armed forces. A related theme of Eastern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern history has been the forced or constructive expulsion of people from their homes, businesses, and properties. If the book of Exodus provides an insight into these practices in the biblical past, early 20th century history is replete with more recent examples which form the backdrop to what happened to the citizens of Famagusta and other citizens of the Republic of Cyprus of all racial and religious backgrounds. Think of the expulsion of the Armenian and Greek Orthodox Christians from Asia Minor prior to, during, and immediately after 1922. Think of the expulsion of the Turks, the Turkish Muslims, I should say, from Greece following the 1923 Greek-Turkish Convention. Think of the expulsion and extermination of the Jews of Thessaloniki and other parts of Greece during the Second World War. In common with the citizens of Famagusta in 1974 and other, other Cypriots of all backgrounds, all of these people were at the mercy of a government and its armed forces without any protection from independent courts. Accordingly, all lost their homes, properties and businesses, if not their title, in the case of the Famagustans, without the due process of law. And worst of all, perhaps, they were all targeted for the very simple reason that they belonged to a particular religion, be it Christianity, Judaism, Islam or other. Thanks in large part to the United Kingdom, the United Nations responded to the defeat of Hitler by championing the rule of law. Thus, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, we saw the emergence of the United Nations Charter, the Genocide Convention, the Geneva Conventions, the European Convention on Human Rights, and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. These treaties and others were designed to prohibit many of the practices associated with the pre-1945 period. As such, they sought to promote religious tolerance and protect as well as empower civilians. Needless to say, as Greece is discovering to its cost today, it's one thing to introduce laws and identify values on paper. It's quite another thing as to whether those laws and values are translated and honoured in practice. Turkey is bound by the legal principles and rules embodied within the aforementioned treaties. Nevertheless, when the armed forces of that country invaded the Republic of Cyprus in 1974, they showed scant regard for the law or for the rights of citizens. The primary evidence, among other, other forms of evidence, lies in the fact that 40,000 or so citizens of Famagusta were driven or constructively ousted from their homes and businesses without any due process of law. And they have been prevented from returning, all because of their religion. By the same token, there were Turkish Cypriot citizens who were herded north of the ceasefire line because of their religion. In combined consequence, Turkey not only occupied the northern areas of the Republic, including Famagusta, Turkey managed to de-Christianize and colonize those areas in violation of the Geneva Conventions while procuring de facto, though not de jure, partition and religiously based segregation. Greek Cypriots south of the line, Turkish Cypriots north of the line. I'm reminded of the memorable words of the late Dr. Martin Luther King in his letter from Birmingham jail dated 16th of April 1963. Segregation ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. All that being said, as we know, Famagusta was marked by two anomalies following the invasion. Firstly, the fenced off area was not populated. And secondly, a pocket of Greek Orthodox Christians in the Garpas Peninsula within Famagusta district and just a few miles from the town itself, did not flee from their homes and properties, or at least not all of them did. They stayed put, yet rather like the Greek Orthodox inhabitants of Istanbul or those of Alexandria, they have been subject to various forms of direct or indirect discrimination. 
And I must at this point cite the observations of the European Court of Justice in the case of Cyprus and Turkey from 2001. The court concluded that those residents of the, of the Garpas Peninsula had had their rights under Article 3 of the European Convention violated by Turkey. Und Article 3, under Article 3, no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And according to the judgment, and I quote from the court here, it is an inescapable conclusion that the interferences at issue were directed at the Garpas Greek Cypriot community for the very reason that they belong to this class of persons. The treatment to which they were subjected during the period under consideration can only be explained in terms of the features which distinguish them from the Turkish Cypriot population namely their ethnic origin, race and religion. The conditions under which the population is condemned to live are debasing and violating, violate the very notion of respect for the human dignity of its members. In the court's opinion, with reference to the period under consideration, the discriminatory treatment attained a level of severity which amounted to degrading treatment. All of which is rather sad, but in keeping with the history and the culture of the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, there is a British interest in all of this. For a start, the fate of Famagusta represents an affront to fundamental British values, notably the rule of law, about which the late great Lord Bingham wrote so eloquently in the book that he wrote shortly before he died. And I encourage everybody to read both the book of Lord Bingham and the collected works of Martin Luther King. Besides that, the United Kingdom continues to regard itself as being under a lingering legal duty to recognize and guarantee the independence, territorial integrity, and security of the Republic of Cyprus. And the shabby state of Famagusta represents a constant reminder that the United Kingdom must do more to fulfill this duty. No less importantly, British national interests and British expeditionary strategy are engaged by Famagusta. Under the Treaty of Establishment of 1960, the town contains two sites which have been retained by the United Kingdom but are not presently occupied because of the, uh, the de facto partition. By the same token, Famagusta has a port which in legal theory, Royal Navy ships have a treaty right to enter. On top of all of that, Famagusta is just four or five miles away from the signals intelligence station at Ayos Nigolaus, which is an integral part of a British overseas territory. Within that British overseas territory, one finds a British Ofsted regulated primary school together with an associated British military community. So there is a fundamentally important British strategic interest in keeping a watchful eye on Famagusta. And in the words of the Defence Secretary of this country, Mr. Hammond, uh, last year, the sovereign base areas are in a region of geopolitical importance and high priority for the United Kingdom's long-term national security interests. And remember, the expeditionary operations in relation to Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya have all hinged upon the sovereign base areas as well as the cooperation extended by the Republic of Cyprus, as well as the cooperation extended by Egypt. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, to draw some conclusions. I should have addressed the chair, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's time to draw some conclusions. The most obvious one is that everybody in the Eastern Mediterranean should no longer behave in a way that harks back to the pre-1945 era. If anything connects the economic calamity which has befallen Greece, the bloodshed inflicted in Syria, and the indignity suffered by the citizens of Famagusta, it is the failure of states and citizens to observe the rule of law and the principles of ethical conduct. Looking to the future, a huge effort, I would call it a martial plan in the field of education. A martial plan is needed across the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. The effort must deliver public education, it must nurture civil society, it must encourage religious tolerance, it must, must promote equality, one of the foundations of the rule of law. It must attack discrimination wherever it is found and it must foster ethical conduct in both the private and the public spheres. It bears emphasizing that the European Union, whatever its flaws, and it has many, and I'm a mild Eurosceptic in British political terms, whatever one thinks of the European Union, it is founded on the rule of law and related values. Under the preamble to the Treaty on the European Union, which binds the United Kingdom, Greece, 
Cyprus and should bind, by extension, um, aspirant members such as Turkey. The European Union is founded on the Europe universal values of the inviolable and inalienable rights of the human person, freedom, dignity, equality, and the rule of law. The citizens of Famagusta, including those who are here today, are entitled to the protection afforded by those values. Turkey must act accordingly, must honor its obligations and obey the law. Turkey's made significant strides in that direction, but it has not gone far enough. And regrettably, on occasion, it tends to behave in a manner that combines the very worst authoritarian aspects of Ottomanism, Kemalism, militarism, and now Islamism. <coughs> For all of those reasons, I've campaigned against de facto partition, against de jure partition, and also against the de jure carve-up of the Republic into a religiously based bi-zonal, bi-communal federation, which entrenches discrimination against Greeks in the north and entrenches discrimination against Turks in the south and would, as a consequence, entrench discrimination against anybody who is neither Greek nor Turkish. And we are living, ladies, Mr. Chairman, we are living in a, in a moment when more than 20% of the population of the Republic of Cyprus is neither Greek Cypriot nor Turkish Cypriot. Those of you who've been to Nicosia or Larnaca or Limassol recently would have seen that the streets of those towns resemble the streets of London. They no longer resemble the Cyprus of 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. So I will leave you with this thought, ladies and gentlemen. It's no longer possible it's no longer permissible in law for Famagusta to be treated in this way and for the citizens, to borrow the magic phrase of Martin Luther King, to be treated as things. They are citizens. They are entitled to human dignity and they are entitled to the protection of the fundamental rights which the European Union has bequeathed to them. History shows, you might say, that this is all pie in the sky. We, this is been the state of affairs since biblical times. We can't change it. But history shows that it is possible to change the law, and it is possible to change attitudes, cultures, and practices as well. That is why, 44 years after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Barack Hussein Obama is seeking re-election as the President of the United States. Perhaps, therefore, the last word ought to be left to the late Dr. King. We must either learn to live together as brothers or we are all going to perish together as fools. Thank you. You may recall, most of you, that following the Turkish invasion in 1974, if you, you know, for those of us who remember the headlines of newspapers in the fall of 1974, Many times it was put forward that the, the return of Famagusta was imminent as a first step towards confidence-building measures between the two communities and as a first fundamental move towards a breakthrough uh, in, this, in the Cyprus question. I remember that, uh, yeah, even, you know, I remember that, that repeatedly. So it was it was also included in the first high, in the second high-level agreement, 1979, between President Kiprianu at the time and the Turkish Cypriot leader Raoul Tehtash, that with the you know that uh, the return from Augusta would take place with the beginning of, of negotiations between the two communities. Now, this was put forward repeatedly, but nothing in in reality took uh, place. In 1919. 83, following the unilateral declaration of independence by the regime in the north, okay, which was condemned, the UN uh, followed its, its resolution in, in 1948, uh, which again called for the return from Augusta. So there was pressure. And again, uh, following the failure of the attempt under Putros Ghali to uh, pursue successfully uh, the set of ideas in 1992-93, again we came back with the idea of the issue of Famagusta as part of a CBM package to see how there could be a breakthrough in the Cyprus question. The whole idea was that there would be tangible benefits for all parties involved and at the same time there would be 
the creation of the political will to move forward. That was the central idea. Again, following the rejection of the Annan plan and the deliberations in relation to enhancing Turkey's accession negotiation process, again, Famagusta was uh, in the headlines. Now, I would say the following in, in relation, having mentioned that three, four times the issue of Famagusta was brought forward, I would say that Traditionally, following 1974, the position of the Greek Cypriot side was that there would be a comprehensive solution to the Cyprus problem. Uh, you know, for those of us who speak Greek, they said we should avoid amohostobisi to Kibriagu, meaning that we should avoid dealing only with Famagusta and forgetting about everything else. At the same time, the Turkish side said, let's take it step by step. They wanted to focus on CBM, but it's important to see Although that they were saying that they wanted CBMs, in reality, uh, they would never honor whatever was agreed. For example, there was an agreement in 1975, in, an agreement in relation to Carpazia, the third of Vienna, that, was, that the Turkish side never really implemented. And there is something, and, and there is another, and there is another something else that we must uh, point out. Although the Turkish side in the, in, in the 70s, when it was under extreme pressure, they pretended that they would be eager to discuss from Augusta. Nowadays, what do they say? That there would be CBMs, but the fence city of Augusta would be returned only within the framework of a comprehensive Cyprus solution. It's very important to keep this in historical perspective and, and, and the political implications of this. Now, we saw that on April 23, 2003, the Turkish side moved unilaterally to partially lift some of the restrictions to the free movement of people uh, along both sides of the, of, the, of the Green Line. That was a step that attracted international attention. The Republic of Cyprus followed a week later with substantive measures, uh, openings towards the Turkish Cypriot community, as community and as individuals, but uh, the impressions at the time were won by the Turkish side, by, by the side of the, of the, of the um, Turkish occupation regime. Now, coming back to the coming back to the issue from Augusta. Right now, there is, you know, there is in 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 the theory of conflict theory the view that really it's very difficult sometimes after a protracted struggle to have a, a comprehensive solution to all the problems involved. And sometimes, theoretically, the issue put forward is that if it is possible to start with some uh, confidence-building measures and also some mutual steps, then there would be benefits and also the creation of political will so that uh, you move forward uh, in a gradual and evol evolutionary process towards a comprehensive solution. And I think this today has acquires greater importance. Why? We have a new development in the Cyprus question. The Republic of Cyprus is getting ready to assume the presidency of the European Union. There is, there is a roadmap, but it's, it's getting ready. EU-Turkish negotiations, accession negotiations, are not going anywhere. So the issue again, what do we do? It has been, it has been put forward again in the press that the Turkish side may be thinking to allow the return of uh, the fence, to allow the, the inhabitants of the, in the fence city of Augusta, but under Turkish Cypriot control. I think that would be very problematic. But let me, before I go to that, try to explain the potential benefits of a proper return of the fence city of Augusta, either under the UN auspices or even directly under the Republic of Cyprus. There would be reconstruction, houses, buildings, infrastructure, the sewage system, telecommunications. I think okay, that at least we would, they would, um, we would need about 6 billion euros for the uh, initial stages of reconstruction. <coughs> Where that money would come from? It could come from it's state money, private money, EU funds, and foreign investment. I think that this this would be the first, uh, the first series of spending. Now, this in itself, it would release much higher spending. 
it would involve it would involve job creation for uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. We are going to have uh, the port of Famagusta functioning in a legitimate manner and in a way that it, it, it would lead to an expansion of business. And I think the economic benefits of, of the reconstruction of Famagusta would have a spillover effect throughout the island. I dare say that it would be the beginning of a new economic miracle. I'm talking, you may recall the economic miracle of the reconstruction that took place after 74. I think if we have such a process, it would be a very fundamental big step forward. And it would not be only economic. It would be, it would be beyond that. There would be a great, um, a great political impact. The issue is that, understand, understandably, for this to take place, it must take place within a comprehensive CBM, a fundamental CBM package. Perhaps it may involve uh, uh, opening some chapters in the negotiations between EU and Turkey, namely the energy chapter. And also, it would be a very fundamental step forward in the beginning of a normalization process in the relation between the Republic of Cyprus and Turkey. And I would come to that the implications of that if it were going to take place. Now, I, I try to talk about the positive scenario. That, but there is another scenario which may not be so positive. In the event that the Turkish side decides to move on with the opening of the fence city of Famagusta under Turkish Cypriot administration, I'm afraid under these circumstances we may have confusion, disunity, and legal complications. Under these circumstances, understandably, some Greek Cypriots would say we would like to return no matter what. It is understandable. Mm, we have to understand it. Another number of Greek Cypriots would say we are not prepared to return under Turkish Cypriot administration. And there would be some others who would be willing to sell their properties. And again, this would raise the issue of, um, it would be, it would raise the issue of legitimacy, it would raise the issue of, uh, of, of what is the next step. And under such circumstances, it would be the reconstruction process, it would be much more difficult. In the first scenario, I painted a very positive uh, picture saying about the six billion that would come in one way or another. In the second, in the second scenario, I think uh, it would be much more difficult for this to take place. And uh, in such a case, the politics of the Cyprus problem would become even more difficult in, in, in this scenario. The question is, how do we move forward? I think I, I have no doubt in my mind that, and let me talk about the substance of the Cyprus problem, because we have been used to by communal negotiations as if the major dimension of the problem are the relations between the two communities. I will not deny that the relations between the two communities, the past, the present, and the future, it's a major dimension. But it is, not the most, it is not the most important dimension. There are two issues that we must, not, we must never forget. The fact that Turkey occupies almost 40% of the Republic of Cyprus. And second, and perhaps this is even worse, Turkey does not recognize the sacred right of the Republic of Cyprus to exist. I think this is the heart of the issue. Because if it were to recognize that, we could easily arrive at an agreement involving a CBM package, involving Famagusta, and the road to a better future for all Cypriots, as well as a better road, a better future uh, for the peoples in the area, it would have been much easier. So I come back to the issue of what is, is taking place, uh, what is taking place with Turkey. And, and you know, we understand power and the relative balances. Turkey is a strong country, it's a regional power which declares that it wants to be in peaceful and friendly relations with its neighbors. I think the case of, of Cyprus is one of the areas, is one of the issues that this proves this Turkish um, objective. The EU and several countries and powers may convince Turkey to take a bold and brave step in the right direction because I have no doubt a country can never be free if it denies freedom from its neighbors and from any other group of people in direct relation with it. So I think this is also uh, an important step for Turkey. 
I do believe that despite the fact that things are difficult, that in the era of the 21st century, in, in the 21st century, in an era of uh, the interplay of ideas, in an area, in an era where we have witnessed change in, 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 a, in, in a manner which surprised everybody, I think this, that this could be possible. Famagusta, I think, can serve broader objectives. It could break the ice between all sides involved. I think it would facilitate the relations between the two communities in Cyprus, I have no doubt. It would generate multidimensional multi benefits, not only in Cyprus, but and beyond. And it would also serve as a litmus test for the ability of Turkey to change. And I think that would be uh, a step in the right direction. Politically, more often than not, it is the case that players stick to their positions. If Turkey finds the courage, with the persuasion of some of its powerful allies in the European Union and beyond, and understand to move on the case of Famagusta in a way that it would create a positive climate and it, would, and, and it would lead to a year of cooperation. I have no doubt that there would be progress in Cyprus, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and beyond. And I think that's where we should concentrate. So my, my point is that while at the same time we keep an eye to a comprehensive solution of the Cyprus problem, we must not ignore the potential and the power of an evolutionary, of an evolutionary process, which it could lead to great effects. And I think this could be a feasible objective of the political forces in the Republic of Cyprus, as well as um, the European Union and other interested parties in the international community. I think if Turkey is allowed to play the whole issue in an, in an antagonistic manner, I think things would, be, uh, would become worse. There would be greater tensions, I'm, I'm finishing Mr. Chairman, greater tensions, and I think that should not be encouraged. I think that we are uh, at a time when with political courage and the right political moves, we can create great opportunities for all the parties involved. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, begin by expressing my gratitude to a fellow lawyer uh, and uh, the, uh, our member of parliament sponsoring today, David Burrows, uh, for this invitation to speak and also uh, to lobby and to the Famagusta People's Association. I know uh, that David Burrows shares, uh, as me, neither of us have a dog in this fight, as, as it were, neither of us are Cypriot, neither of us uh, have property in Cyprus or in Famagusta. Um, but I think we share uh, a, an innate sense of the injustice that has occurred. Now, my role today was really to uh, wrap up and uh, look at uh, the comments made uh, by uh, the various parties. And I'm hoping that uh, Mayor Gallons uh, uh, will, who must be the only mayor of a foreign occupied military base and its environs, uh, I'm hoping that you will elucidate for us the political journey and the fundamental human wrong of the displacement by force of a civilian community. Uh, something that really hasn't re happened anywhere else uh, in Europe since uh, the Second World War in East Germany, uh, I think of particularly. Um, Dr. Kliarkos uh, Kliarkos Kliarkos uh, rightly reminds us of the history uh, of this appalling human, tra human tragedy and the injustice. He also points out the ineffectiveness of the law in getting prompt redress uh, for so many people, and also the fact of the multicultural nature of society now. Um, I also think that uh, Professor Theophanus uh, rightly reminds us at a time of impending economic disaster as Greece is on the bus out of the Euro, uh, as Cyprus is having to intervene uh, to support its third bank with other countries suffering. Um, 
At this time, Pre Professor Theophanes, you've rightly pointed up uh, the economic waste of a city in stasis, or, or as you would have it, uh, uh, deadlocked. Uh, a beach that is unreachable to all but a few tin pot generals from the Turkish occupying force. Um, uh, that certainly is unreachable by tourists. It's certainly uh, an economic dead weight uh, 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 is Famagusta. And I think that uh, in human rights and, and international law, you rightly advert to foreign investment. Um, and it's quite clear to me that nowhere in the world will you have, and there's some very good research being done by Oxford University and the World Bank about inward investment uh, and regeneration, but it won't come from the big sovereign funds of places like Norway, of Singapore, of Kuwait, Qatar, uh, even China or the Soviet Union or former Soviet Russia. Uh, it won't come until there is legal certainty. People will not put in money until they are sure that when they put their investment in, A, it is secure, they're going to get proper legal title, what they get they think they can buy, and secondly, they have an effective remedy, an effective remedy which is enforceable by proper legal courts within uh, an administration, and that those uh, courts' judgments are going to be reciprocally enforced around the world. And of course, this brings me to the uh, the problem that we have, that 38 years ago, on the 20th of July 1974, we have a problem, which is that the invasion led the international community to leave us in a situation where they recognize only one legitimate owner of Cyprus, one so lawful sovereign body, uh, and that is the state of Cyprus. Um, there is no recognition for the so-called TRNC, and it would be incompatible with the rule of law, with international law, that you can obtain territorial change through the force of arms or the threat of the, force, of the use of force of arms. Uh, and any, sub uh, any subversion of this would be a subversion of international law. It would also be, uh, involve a breach of the UN security resolutions I'm thinking particularly of 541 of 1983, which was reaffirmed the year, a year later in May 84, uh, and that there have been four other reaffirming uh, international resolutions at the UN ever since then. And so we have an intractable position, uh, and it leads me to remind us of something which is slightly unusual, and we don't think of it in, in, in these terms, I think. But we have to remind ourselves that Northern Cyprus is part of the European Union. Northern Cyprus is part of the European Union. And the proof of that, if you will, and I'm, I'm reminded of it particularly as we have three academics here, uh, one from Hertfordshire, one from Cyprus, and myself as the chair of the University of East London. Uh, we have three academics, and I was interested to note that uh, increasingly, people from northern Cyprus are taking the benefit of a Cypriot passport so that their children can go, they, they can live uh, in, on land which is stolen, they can work on land which is stolen in international law uh, for which no compensation has been paid, uh, yet their children can take the benefit uh, of a Cypriot passport and go to Scotland, for example, and study at Glasgow, Edinburgh, St Andrews, free of charge. Our children have to go there and we pay £9,000 a year for the privilege. This, it seems to me, uh, has a certain irony about it. And it does seem to me that there is a, a fundamental injustice and a fundamental wrong which re requires uh, uh, putting right. So much for that in terms of what the lawyer had to say. We have, I think, to recognise that the EU is not becoming the attractive, or is no longer the attractive proposition that Turkey once thought it was. Uh, I think that uh, its desire to join is probably withering on the vine. And as a result of that, the, the, the pressure that there's always been on Turkey to resolve things, certainly that the French have always put in play 
to ensure a resolution in a political dimension has started to evaporate. The UN has moved on to other less intractable problems. And so we're in a, a situation where uh, Turkey has no incentive from a political perspective. We also have to recognize the reality of what is going on in Turkey, which is that there's a growing fundamentalism in Turkey, which is also going to militate domestically in that country against a political resolution, which leaves us really with the one last opportunity, which is that the one that you posit, which is about economic reality, economic regeneration, Turkey needs economic regeneration. Cyprus needs economic regeneration. The European Union needs economic regeneration. I think the only hope for a legal solution is, to, is forced by the economic imperative. And it's there where I think that must, one must put one's efforts in order to get a just legal solution. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, the Famagusta Association, uh, for keeping the problem of Famagusta alive. And uh, I like you, my friends, that uh, you are here today to listen to us after 38 years, and you still have the patience uh, to dream and have the vision of the return to our town of Famagusta. I have to say that there are nine refugee towns in Cyprus. Uh, Morfu, Kyrenia, Karavas, Labithos, Lysi, Agathus, Ithrea, Lefkoniko. Uh, and about 180 uh, refugee communities. What distinguishes Famagusta, which is the largest of the lot, uh, it used to be almost the second biggest town in Cyprus before the invasion, and of course the most developing, is the fact that Famagusta uh, is occupied by Turkish military troops. And the only case where there is a mention of Turkish occupation in Cyprus is in Resolution 550 of the Security Council of 1984. Nowhere else there is a clear mention of the Turkish occupation in United Nations resolutions. And this Resolution 550 is a binding resolution of the Security Council, which was, of course, succeeded by another Security Council Resolution concerning Famagusta, number 789 of 1992. There has been a failure uh, of international law in Cyprus, particularly in the case of this beautiful town, now a ghost town, uh, a failure of uh, keeping international treaties, a failure of implementation of resolutions, a failure of successive sec Secretary Generals of the United Nations uh, to do their duty, uh, to keep faith to their mandate. When uh, President Christofias wrote to Baki Moon three years ago, requesting him to take steps to return the town of Amagusta as per these two resolutions, and before these resolutions you mentioned it, there was a high-level agreement between Kiprian and Tektash, again referring to Famagusta. Of course, the president did not uh, uh, publish the correspondence. Mr. Bakimun replied that Famagusta will be given back at the end, uh, with the end of negotiations, uh, uh, at the end of the road with a solution. That was uh, outside his mandate. His mandate says very clearly that he has to implement these resolutions which gave priority of returning immediately to the town of Famagusta. But it's also a mistake of the international community, and thus, that uh, we have followed this effort of, com of comprehensive solution, and we have not used the weapon, uh, the tool of legality, to the extent that we should have done. Because at the end, unless you insist on the rule of law and the application of the rule of law and legality, uh, negotiations will bring you nowhere when the other part of the negotiations feels strong enough uh, not to obey uh, with international legality. Uh, so I think one of the mistakes we did in our wish to achieve a solution, and I think it was a genuine mistake under the circumstances, is that uh, we focused on the bicommunal talks in the hope that with arriving at a solution on the bicommunal level, 
that would have solved everything else, including the withdrawal of Turkish troops from Cyprus, uh, the li limitation uh, or, uh, let's say, the stopping of the policy uh, of illegal immigration, of settlement, and the respect of human rights. Unfortunately, that was not the policy of Turkey. The policy of Turkey comes very clearly in the book that Mr. Davutoglu wrote. And uh, I invite you to, to read that book, because in that book, uh, everything becomes very clear. He says that Cyprus has strategic interest for Turkey. The question of Turkish Cypriots is a secondary thing. And even if there was not a single Turkish Cypriot in Cyprus, we should have invented Turkish Cypriots for the interest of, of Turkey. So let us have no illusions. And if we have no illusions, and of course we should try to reach a bicommunal settlement, but uh, I think the subject matter has changed. Uh, with the illegal immigration, the majority now in Cyprus are not Turkish Cypriots who are living. To be able to meet this kind of attitude towards Cyprus, the attitude of strategic interest in the area, we have to counter it with very clear and present thoughts from our side. And these clear and present thoughts say this, that we must increase the cost to Turkey of the continuous Turkish occupation of Cyprus. And how can we increase this cost? Small Cyprus, by trying to build uh, any kind of alliances we can. I think the present uh, improvement of, of relations with Israel is very important. Uh, I think that we should exercise, let us say, more influence in the United Kingdom uh, and the United States. I'm afraid to say, uh, with all uh, respect and admiration I have to uh, the British policies and the, the British role in the world, there is a kind of benign neglect as far as Cyprus is concerned, both from Britain and from the uh, United States. The big interest in the world, but uh, we have to focus there. Europe today is weak. Greece is very weak. Very correctly was mentioned that uh, Europe is not so attractive at present to Turkey. Uh, and uh, it's not such a big paradox uh, what uh, otherwise we would have called it the big paradox of the day to have a, uh, an applicant knocking at the door of Europe and at the same time occupying a European town that's one of the biggest paradoxes in history and yet we accept this paradox because Turkey is strong Turkey appears to be able to control developments in the Arab Spring appears to be able to control uh, the roots of oil, uh, of energy. Uh, Turkey is playing the game with Syria. So unless we have some very clear thinking uh, of what we, we must pursue on the Cyprus issue, then I think we, will, we are losing our time. I agree with you, not because I'm mayor of Augusta. Uh, is, is because I have always this attitude towards Samagusta that I became mayor of Samagusta.